Good evening, and we are back again for the analysis of the seer and the scene. We were on, we had completed verse 9, and we are about to start verse 10. Let's go to verse 10. So far we have got that I am not the body, not the mind. I am the witness of the body and mind. Why am I not the body and mind? Because the body and the mind are the scene and I am the seer. Clearly I experience my body. Clearly I experience my mind. Therefore they are objects. They are not me, the experiencer. So I am the witness. I am pure consciousness which does not increase or decrease, which does not change. So this immortal spiritual reality I am but even given this numerous questions will arise at this point first of all if I am an unchanging consciousness how is it that sometimes I feel very conscious alert uh, maybe after morning yoga and a cup of uh, tea I feel alert and at the end of the day I feel not particularly conscious I feel tired and sleepy how is that possible and then sometimes and then I fall asleep, I don't seem to be conscious at all. So if I'm an unchanging consciousness, why does it keep seem to keep changing? That's one question. Another question could be that um, if we are all this pure consciousness, why are some people nasty, some people are nice, some people are, uh, you know, uh, they are very determined and, and, and disciplined, some people can't seem to get it together. Why so much differences if, if we are all that one same pure consciousness? And then there is this other whole question about, you know, in, in the most of the Eastern religions, in all the Eastern religions, in fact, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and so on, we believe in many lives, that we have gone through different lives. If we are this unchanging consciousness, the body obviously dies. At the end, end of one particular life, the body dies. Then what is it that changes that what is it that goes from body to body is it this consciousness which goes from body to body what is it that evolves what is it that grows what is it that learns if consciousness is one and unchanging how can it evolve or uh, grow or learn so all these questions are there and all of them are answered by one key understanding in Vedanta in fact in all of Indian philosophy the human being is understood to have three aspects. Normally we talk about body-mind, but here there are, there, there are three aspects of the human being. We have three aspects. One is the body. In Sanskrit it's called sthula sharira, gross body. By which I don't mean that the body is necessarily gross. It just, it just means physical body. Gross body means physical. And then inside this, pervading this body, is what is called the subtle body. The subtle body, in Sanskrit, sukshma sharira. Again, not theoretical. It's not something that is you will read in philosophy. With what is it? We mystified. No, it's it's very simple actually. Here is the physical body, the gross body. Check and look inside. You have thoughts, feelings, ideas, memories, desires, all of that what we call the mind, that's the subtle body. That's simply what is called the subtle body. Beyond that, again, they talk about in Vedanta of a causal body. I'm not mentioning that now because he has also not mentioned it here. And beyond that is actually our real self, which is pure consciousness. Now, all these questions which we had, all these questions, why does consciousness seem to vary? Waking, dreaming, sleeping, unconscious, tired, alert. Consciousness seems to vary. But actually it's explained with the help of the subtle body. It's the difference in the quality of the mind. Sometimes the mind is agile and sharp and sattvic. Sometimes the mind is dull and tired. That's why consciousness seems to vary. It's not that consciousness varies. It's like, um, like your face is reflected in different mirrors. Now if a mirror is particularly bright and clean, you'll have a very nice reflection of your face. If a mirror is uh, dirty or misty, you'll have a vague reflection of your face. Exactly in the same way, consciousness, your real face is same. Your real face is unchanging. But the reflections are different. 
consciousness remaining one and unchanging depending on the state of the mind it will seem to be you will seem to feel more conscious or less conscious more alert or sleepy or unconscious so the reflection of consciousness changes depending on the mind consciousness itself your real nature is unchanging that's the explanation in fact we will see in a series of verses all these questions will be taken up and explanations will be given all of these explanations are on the basis of the subtle body um even before i go into the verses i can give you a little more detail about the subtle body if you want a little more detail if you take look at the paradigm of the five sheets pancha kosha then the annamaya the food sheet that's the physical body the the gross body which is made of food what we eat and drink then the pranamaya the vital sheet the manomaya the mind sheet the vijnanamaya the intellect sheet these three are called the subtle body sukshma sharira the subtle body itself has different components uh, in fact if you want to split it up further go further down into detail in the prashna upanishad for example the subtle body is supposed to have 17 parts pretty easy actually 17 parts are five sense organs five motor organs the five pranas prana apana vyana udana samanda five pranas and the mind and the intellect manobuddhi if you make it mind intellect memory and ego it becomes 19 parts but whatever 17 or 19 that's the subtle body and that's what we continuously feel inside as the mind now let's go into these verses questions which come to our mind will be answered here verse number 10 it will be nice if we can chant along so i'll chant and you follow me verse number 10 ahankara laye supto ahankara laye supto bhaved deho pya chetana भवेद देहो प्यचेतन अहंकार विकासार्ध अहंकार विकासार्ध स्वप्न सर्वस्तु जागर स्वप्न सर्वस्तु जागर हियर द क्वेश्चन इज टेकन अप दैट इफ कॉन्शियसनेस इज वन एंड कंटिन्यूअसली शाइनिंग देन व्हाट इज स्लीप व्हाट इज ड्रीम व्हाट इज वेकिंग normally we loosely sort of speak of three states of consciousness but actually if you strictly follow vedanta these are not three states of consciousness these are three states of the mind waking dreaming and deep sleep so here it said here uh, if you look at it instead of saying the whole mind the author here uses only the the ego ahankara here he says when the ahankara the ego is re- resolved when the ego is not functioning and say when is that blessed state when the ego is not functioning <laughs> we all get it every time we fall asleep in deep sleep when you're not dreaming in deep sleep you don't have the feeling you have no feeling at all you don't feel that i am sleeping if you feel that you're not sleeping so i <laughs> there's this funny story they tell in in you know the parents in india when they will make sure a naughty child is it's very difficult to put a little child to bed so whether the child is actually sleeping or not the mother will sometimes say if the good boy or girl is asleep then his or her left foot will move and the child moves its left foot you know that the child is is, is is not asleep so yeah that's a trick that moms might play if you have the sense of i am sleeping or not sleeping the i sense the ego sense is dissolved in deep sleep try to imagine what it is like to be in deep sleep we go into this state every day every night we fall asleep in into a deep dreamless sleep in sanskrit it is called sushupti clearly you don't have a sense of individuality there that i exist so the ego is dissolved in deep sleep then the ego when it is half functioning that's called the dream state and the ego when it is fully alert and awake that is the waking state generally in vedanta instead of saying just the ego we say when the mind is resolved it's deep sleep when the mind is half awake half functioning we have dreams and when the mind is more or less fully functional we have the waking state 
So instead of saying the whole mind here, he is using ego, ahankara. But basically, he means the same thing. So this answers the question, if I am an unchanging, ever-shining consciousness, how is it that I get waking, dreaming and deep sleep? Waking, dreaming and deep sleep depend on the functioning or the half-functioning or the non-functioning of the mind or the ego, not on consciousness. So when you are awake, the mind is fully functional, connected to the body, your consciousness illumines this fully functional mind connected to the body. When we sleep and dream, we lose touch with the sleeping body, but in our minds we generate a world of dreams and consciousness illumines that world of dreams. And when the mind shuts down in deep sleep, consciousness illumines the darkness of deep sleep. sleep. In fact, you might say that's a strange way of thinking of deep sleep. We normally think that Common sense says that in, in deep sleep we are not conscious. But Vedanta says in deep sleep we are conscious. In, in India, in fact, in one of our ashrams there was a conference on consciousness. Um, neuroscientists and philosophers and so on. And they couldn't really agree on what deep sleep was. Finally, one of the philosophers, a Sankhyan philosopher, who is American by the way, um, he asked this question to a neuroscientist. He asked, Doctor, according to neuroscience, is there consciousness in deep sleep? And he said, no. The way we define consciousness, there is no consciousness in deep sleep. And this Sankhyan philosopher, he said, well, according to Vedanta or even Sankhya, in deep sleep, there is only consciousness. You might find that mystifying. You know, we think the deep sleep, no consciousness. We actually say in deep sleep there is only consciousness. The objects of consciousness are not there. So you do not have experiences. It's like somebody gave a very nice example. A car climbing up a mountainside in the dark. In the, in the headlights of the car. In the headlights of the car you can see insects from flitting by. You can see raindrops if there is rain and so on and so forth. As the car goes up to the peak of the hill and the lights shine, shine out into the dark sky to infinity, the lights shine out there. Since there is nothing, if the sky is clear, there is nothing to reflect that light. It will look like there is no light at all. You see what I'm saying? When the light is focused out into darkness and there's, there's no mist or anything like that or rain and it's a dark night, the light because it is not reflecting anything, it will seem like there is no light at all. It seems like darkness. For example, in, our, in space right now, out there, it seems like darkness. Sunlight is streaming through that. When a comet passes through it or a satellite passes through it, then you see it twinkling. Otherwise, it's, it seems like darkness. Exactly like that, in deep sleep, it looks like nothing, like darkness. But Vedanta says consciousness remains there, constant. Because the mind is not functional, you have no experiences. I like to put it this way. Deep sleep is not an absence of experience. It is an experience of absence. Yeah. You experience the nothingness. Only thing is the mind is not there, so you don't feel that I am experiencing nothingness. You don't feel that. So this is the verse, Ahankara lai supto, in deep sleep, the ego is resolved. Bhavet deho api achetana, and the body also becomes as if unconscious. Remember the mechanism which we read. Consciousness is reflected in the ego. Through the ego, the mind appears to be conscious. The ego appears to be conscious. The mind appears to be conscious. All the way down to the body. The body appears to be conscious. Right now, it feels like a conscious body. But when the ego is resolved, there's nothing to reflect consciousness anymore. And so you don't have the experience of a conscious mind. You don't have the experience of a conscious body also. So the body also appears to be unconscious. Ahankara vikasardha. When the ego is half functional, sapnaha, dreams. And when the ego is fully functional, sarvaha, jagara, waking. Simple enough. So this is an explanation of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Though consciousness is constant, because of the changes in the mind and the ego, 
you have these three experiences. Verse 11. Anta karana vrittishcha, anta karana vrittishcha, jiti chayai kya magata, jiti chayai kya magata, vasana kalpayet swapne, vasana kalpayet swapne, bodhe akshair vishayan bahihi, bodhe akshair vishayan bahihi, this verse explains in a little more detail how waking and dreaming take place. So, what happens in waking and dreaming? Mind is functional. Antakkarana vritti. Vritti means a movement of the mind, a modification of the mind. You know, when you say yoga is chitta vritti nirodha, mod the cessation of the modifications of the mind. So, modifications of the mind, they reflect consciousness. Chiti chaya aikya magata. They become identified with the reflection of consciousness in them. And in dreams, what happens? Vasana kalpayet swapne. The impressions of the waking state are in our mind. And we use them to generate a movie, which we call a dream. It's like watching TV or watching a movie. What's it generated? What's it made of? It's mostly impressions collected from the, uh, our, our experiences in the waking state. Those are in the memory and those are used to generate dreams. What, what are dreams? The movements of the mind lit up by the reflected consciousness and the contents are impressions. Vasana means impressions which we have gathered in the waking state. And in the waking state what happens? The movements of the mind are now connected to the body. So through the sense organs we, we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, we touch. In the waking state, we are in connection with the physical world through the doors of our sense perception. And the mind also changes accordingly. So I see a person and in the mind, I have a vritti, a movement in the shape of that person. I say, okay, I am seeing this person. I hear some words or music and there is a vritti in the mind, a movement in the mind corresponding to that sense input. And I say, okay, I'm listening to music. This is the waking state where sense inputs are brought into the mind. They create vrittis which are lit up by reflected consciousness. And this gives us our waking experience. There's a lot to be said about this. If you go to the Mandukya Upanishad and all, the whole Upanishad is about the waking state and the dream state and the deep sleep state and so on. Basically, you know what happens in these three states, waking, dreaming and deep, deep sleep. It's like one and the same person. That person goes and opens the door of his, the windows of his house and trades with the world. He sells goods, he gets in goods. After some time, he shuts the shutters, goes into his living room, switches on the TV and watches a TV program. After some time, switches off the TV, goes to his bedroom and goes to sleep. Now it's the same person, the one who's the businessman dealing with the world. When in the waking state, that's what we are doing. We are dealing with the world. We get inputs from the world. And we send inputs back into the world. We act and we react. And in dream state, what happens is we shut down the shutters of the senses and retreat within ourselves and watch TV in, in our minds. Switch on the dreams and you watch that. Same consciousness. And then after some time, the TV is also switched off. Dreams are also switched off. And this consciousness retreats into the deep sleep state. The mind goes into deep sleep. And the consciousness is still the same. Just like the same person was the businessman dealing with the world, was the TV watcher, and is the person sleeping in the bed. It's the same person. In the same way, it's the same consciousness which we are, which cycles through these three states of experience. Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Bodhe akshair vishayan bahi. Bodhe means, here bodhe means awakened state. That means in a waking state. Akshay means by sense organs. Literally, Akshay means eyes, but sense organs. Vishayan by external uh, objects. What external objects do we perceive? Rupa, Rasa, Gandha, Sparsha, Shabda. Forms. We see forms. Rasa, we taste. Um, Gandha, we smell. Um, then Sparsha, we touch. 
and uh, Shabda we hear. The five sense inputs, they come in, in the waking state. That's what is said here. So this is an explanation of the waking and the dream state. Verse 12. Mano hankrityu padanam Lingam mekam jadatmakam Lingam mekam jadatmakam Avasthatrayaman veti Avasthatrayaman veti Jayate mriyate tatha Jayate mriyate tatha Explanation continues. The questions that we have about the differences and the changes that take place, all of them are explained by this subtle body. So it says here, one of the well-known names in the Shastras of the subtle body is given here, Linga Sharira. Sukshma Sharira is one name, Linga Sharira is another name. So Lingam, the, the, the subtle body, Jaratmakam, it is devoid of consciousness in itself. This is quite amazing actually. We normally tend to think, if nothing else, at least the mind is conscious. But Vedanta says even the mind is not conscious. You, you are consciousness and you shine upon the mind and the mind appears to be conscious. It is irradiated by your consciousness. Just like the example I gave you about the moon and the sun. We think the moon is a luminous body. And it does. In fact, it serves the purpose of a luminous body. It illumines the earth at night. We can see by moonlight. We talk about moonlight. Poets write poetry about moonlight. But the fact is there is no such thing as moonlight. It's, it's sunlight. Sunlight reflected from the moon, which is uh, illumining the earth at night. Similarly, the subtle body has no consciousness of its own. It is, the, it is you, the consciousness, you shining upon the subtle body, that reflected consciousness lights up the mind. Mano ahankriti, mind and the ego, the ego and the rest of the mind, they are lit up by consciousness. Avasthatrayamanveti. It is this mind which persists through the three states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Waking, fully active. Dreaming, partially active. And deep sleep, inactive. Not only that, Jayate Mriyate Tatha. This is the one which is born with the birth of a new body. This is the one which experiences death with the death of the body and goes on to other worlds and goes on to other lives. This is the one which has lived many lives and so on. All these experiences are possible because of this subtle body. You, the pure consciousness, when you identify yourself, when we say, I am this mind, then when the body is born and the mind gets attached to a body, I feel, I am born. When the body decays, uh, ages, and the mind attached to it feels, I am aging. And we, the consciousness, we also attach to the mind, uh, to the mind we feel, we are aging. And when the body collapses and dies, this is the one which feels death, this, this subtle body. And this is the one which goes on to other lives and other bodies. So this whole cycle of birth and death, life, um, growing up, changing, aging, it's because of the body and this, this physical body and this subtle body. Consciousness itself which you or I really are, neither is born nor dies, neither does it age. It makes possible all these experiences through the subtle body. In fact, if you ask in Vedanta, a central question is, if I am already Atman or Brahman, I am pure consciousness, then who is the one who is sitting here and attending a class and trying to attain, uh, coming for a retreat and trying to attain enlightenment, if I am already, I am one with God, I am Satchidananda. It's in fact, that Satchidananda, limited by or reflected it in this subtle body, which considers itself to be an individual. The technical term in Sanskrit is Jiva, Jiva, individual being. So we consider ourselves to be individuals, though we are that infinite consciousness, because we are channeling ourselves through one subtle body. And we feel limited to being one person. In fact, person, we think we are persons. In fact, person, the word itself, it means a mask. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was surprised to discover 
this word person comes from a root called persona. Uh, the persona actually in Greek theater, it seems uh, the actors would come on stage and they would hold these big masks depending on the character they were playing and they would speak through that. Sona means sound. So speaking through that mask. So people at a distance could see which character, Achilles or who, whoever is on stage, you could identify the character. So the, originally personality meant a mask. So we are not persons. We are that infinite consciousness limited by personhood. We think we are this particular mask. This personality is continuously changing. The mind is continuously changing. The body is continuously changing. Behind that, that unchanging essence is who we are. So, this is the one which is born. This is the one which dies. This is the one which feels I am in bondage. This is the one which comes to retreats in Shivananda Ashram. This is the one which feels I must get liberation. So, this is the individual being. Now, verse number 13. With the verse number 13, we are moving on to much more profound matters. We are going to make a big shift. You see, Advaita Vedanta is accomplished in two steps. Non-dual Vedanta is accomplished in two steps. First, we discover the spiritual reality which we are. You see, before this, we think we are the body-mind. So the first thing we got to learn is, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm that consciousness functioning through the body and mind. So first we discovered that pure consciousness. And that's what we did in verse number one. You know, seer and seen. Seer is different from the seen, do you remember? Eyes are the seer, the forms are seen, eyes are the seer, eyes are seen, the mind is the seer, the mind is seen and the witness consciousness is the seer. So I am that witness consciousness. What did I do? I separated myself, as it were, from the body-mind. That's the first step. But that's not non-duality. Because now you have, you still have duality. There is consciousness and there is everything else. There is the seer and they're all the seen. So you still don't have non-duality. The second step in Advaita Vedanta is all right, I am this pure consciousness. Now, all these things that I experience, the mind, the body, and through the mind and body, the world, what is its relation to this pure consciousness? Are they separate entities? Am I a separate pure consciousness? Further, another question. Each of us, we are separate, clearly separate bodies. We are clearly separate minds. We have different ideas, memories, life experiences. Do we also have separate witness consciousnesses, separate atma, separate selves, spiritual selves? Are we separate at that level also? Or is there one consciousness behind everything? So this, these questions come up. If you say we are all separate selves, then this is called Sankhya philosophy. You stop at that, it's Sankhya philosophy. But Advaita goes a step further. It says something remarkable. As this pure consciousness, when you experience the mind and through the mind, the body and through the mind and mind and body, the world, all of these people and things and objects and thoughts and memories, all of them are nothing but you, the pure consciousness, appearing through Maya under various names and forms. You alone appear as the universe. There's a story about this. Yeah, I think it's time to tell a story. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a popular story uh, in, in the Himalayas among, among the monks there. It's a beautiful story, I think. It's called the Princess of Kashi. So yeah, there are, there's a prince and a princess and so on and so forth. But we'll come back to Vedanta. Um, there was a kingdom, not the kingdom of Kashi, but there was a kingdom in which um, in the court of the king, a play was staged, a dramatic performance. And in that dramatic performance, they wanted a little girl to dress up as the princess of Kashi. Kashi, you know, the holy city, Banaras. So the princess of Kashi was a character in that play. Now, they couldn't find a little girl there in that uh, audience in the royal court. But the prince, 
was a little boy at that time, a child, and he was very cute. And the queen said, dress him up as a girl. He can be the princess of Kashi. So they dressed him up as the princess and he played his role and he looked so cute. His mother, the queen, said to the court painter, I want a portrait of him in that dress, you know, as the princess of Kashi. So paint him like that. So they painted a nice portrait. Today it would have been very easy. She could have just taken a selfie with her son, you know, like. But in those days, it's, you had to get a court painter who would paint the portrait of the prince in that dress costume. Years passed. Fifteen years passed. And the prince was now a grown man, young man, 20, 21 years old. And he was doing all sorts of princely things. And one day, he was exploring the old palace, you know, and going into old storerooms. And uh, then he finds, rummaging around old stuff, and he finds this old painting. And he rubs the dust of the painting. And he sees this girl's little girl's picture and sees it's written, The Princess of Kashi. And it's dated 15 years ago. And he's, he thinks that, oh, she must be my age. And he falls in love with her. <laughs> now, he's so shy, he can't, tell his, he can't tell his father the king or his mother the queen. But he sort of pines away and he mopes and n no longer does princely things. He just sits and sighs. And his mother notices it and says, what's wrong? Tell me. And he's too shy to say that. Finally, the wise old minister comes and takes him aside and says, Prince, you can tell me. What's wrong with you? What's up? And then he sort of shyly says, I have fallen in love. I want to marry this girl and she will be my queen and I don't want anybody else. And the minister says, that's great. Who's she? Oh, she's the princess of Kashi. Oh, that's great. Where did you see her? I haven't actually seen her, but I have seen her picture. Picture? Where did you see her picture? Well, it's actually down in our storerooms. It's an old picture 15 years ago. She was a little kid at that time, but now she must be my age. And I want to marry her. I mean, I won't be happy until I marry her. Then the minister, something goes in his memory. He says, old picture, Princess of Kashi in our storeroom. Take me down there. And so the prince takes him down there and shows him the picture. This is the Princess of Kashi. And the minister sees that and tells the prince, Prince, you need to sit down. Just, <laughs> just, just sit down. I've got something to tell you. <laughs> this is not the um, princess of Kashi. We had to dress somebody up. There was this dramatic performance. And that's why uh, this is not the princess of Kashi. We just uh, dressed this person up as the princess of Kashi. And the prince says, well, whoever she is, I'll marry her. <laughs> it's not even a she. It's a little boy. And it's you, that thou art, Tattva Masi. <laughs> you are that. Now, the moment the prince hears this and understands, and listens to the story, what happens to his desire for the princess of Kashi? It goes away immediately. Why does it go away? Because he can't marry the princess of Kashi? Because it's impossible? Because, um, uh, I mean, what? Because she doesn't exist. No, because what he was desiring was all along none other than himself. He realizes, it's me. Uh, there's nothing ap here apart from me. It's me. This looks different from me, but it's me. So there's nothing here to attain which is not already me. This world is our princess of Kashi. We may laugh at the prince, but that's exactly what we are doing. Swami Vivekananda said, Things in the world are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them. Then we run after them or we run away from them. They are all you. You that pure consciousness, existence, consciousness, bliss, under different names and forms, is this universe. Vivekananda also used to say, never approach anything except as God. Whatever in life, whoever, whatever you meet, whatever happens, any event in life, it's none other than God and that God is none other than you. Existence, consciousness, bliss. So that is non-duality where I recognize I am Satchidananda, but so is everything else and everyone else. And I am one with this universe. It's not that we have different consciousnesses. 
different bodies, different minds, but one consciousness. Not only that, all these different bodies and minds are also that one consciousness shining forth in all these names and forms. It's very interesting. Just today I was reading this uh, article. There's a new theory gaining ground among consciousness in consciousness studies called panpsychism. There's a professor, uh, David Chalmers, uh, he is in NYU. Um, he, he's the head of the mind-brain consciousness unit there. He, in fact, coined the term, the hard problem of consciousness, which I was talking about yesterday. Uh, he subscribes to this view that there is consciousness in everything in the universe. Consciousness is fundamental. It's not something that's generated by the firings of neurons in the brain. It's fundamental to nature everywhere there is consciousness. And this is, and in that article is written that 20 years ago it would have been dismissed as bunkum. But now it's being taken seriously. And this is exactly what Vedanta wants to say. So I don't know where it's all going to go and end up, but it's very promising. All this, by the way, of introduction to the 13th verse. We are changing track here. Now we are going to uh, establish non-duality. You, the pure consciousness, are also non-dual. Non-dual meaning there is no second reality apart from you. Let's see. Shakti Dwayam Himayaya Shakti Dwayam Himayaya Vikshepa Vriti Rupakam Vikshepa Vriti Rupakam Vikshepa Shakti Lingadi Vikshepa Shakti Lingadi Brahmandantam Jagat Srijet Brahmandantam Jagat Srijet Maya, the inconceivable power of Brahman, has two powers, shakti, or two functions, Shakti Dvayam. Two powers, two kinds of Shakti. Vikshepa, which means projecting. Avriti, which means veiling. What does um, the veiling power do? It covers the fact that you are Brahman. It does not allow you to see yourself as you truly are. And what does the vikshepa, the projecting power do? It projects you, Brahman, as this universe. It projects you as a mind, as a body, and as this universe. This universe, properly understood, is Brahman. Satchidananda, existence, consciousness, place. Brahman, misunderstood, is this universe. Shakti dvayam himayaya. Maya has two kinds of powers. One is veiling and one is projecting. It's the classic example of the snake and rope will work here. Our ignorance of the rope. You know the classic example? Somebody is walking around, uh, uh, along a dimly lit path and he, he sees what he thinks is a snake. But actually it's a rope. He doesn't know it's a rope. Goes close to it and sees, oh, it's a rope. But when he was seeing the snake, what was happening? Two things were happening. One, his... Uh, ignorance of the fact that it's a rope did two things. One, it covered the rope, so to say, did not allow him to see it was a rope. And second, it misrepresented, it projected the rope as a snake. So the, our ignorance of the rope, it, it does not let us see that it's a rope, one, and then it projects the rope as a snake. Similarly, what Maya does is, it does not allow us to see that I am Brahman, Satchidananda. And you are all Brahman. This world is nothing but Brahman. One existence, consciousness, bliss. Uh, an infinite being. It does not allow us to see that. And then what, what happens? It projects this world of people and animals and plants and suns and stars and quarks and quasars over that one existence, consciousness, uh, bliss. So two powers. Veiling power, projecting power. Then the whole universe is basically you projected through Maya. How does it do this? 14th verse, verse 14. This is a very beautiful verse. What is creation? What is this universe? You may ask the question, if I am Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss, then what is this universe? How does it come about? Here is the answer. 
सृष्टिर्नाम ब्रह्मे सृष्टिर्नाम ब्रह्मे सच्चिदानंदवस्तुनी सच्चिदानंदवस्तुनी अब्धेनावत्सर्व अब्धेनावत्सर्व नाम प्रसारण नाम प्रसारण It's a beautiful verse. What does it mean? What is this universe, the creation? It says, "On Brahman, which is existence, consciousness, bliss, Brahma rupe satchidananda vastuni." Vastu means reality. On the reality, which is infinite existence, infinite consciousness, infinite bliss, which is called Brahman. On that, nama rupa prasarana. a network of names and forms is thrown over it and so when we look we don't see brahman we don't see an infinite ocean of existence consciousness bliss we see this fractured universe of different people different time space uh, objects good and bad desirable undesirable we see what we call life actually it's one infinite existence actually it is what is called god in different religions this entire universe which we are experiencing and he gives a beautiful example abdhav fenadivat like foam on the surface of the ocean here you have the ocean when you look you see the waves breaking on the shore you see foam the surf on the surface of the waves it's a beautiful you know imagery he says the universe is like foam on the surface of brahman it's a nice way of putting it um brahman is this infinite ocean of existence and this universe of names and forms is just like the fo- the thin layer of foam that you see a streak of foam that you see on the surface of the ocean now it's very interesting i was listening to a talk by lawrence cross who is a well known uh, physicist um staunch atheist he goes ar- around uh, giving talks against religion and all of that so but there was a, a talk about cosmology very very beautiful talk which he gave which i heard that and he said according to the latest ideas of co- um, quantum cosmo- of cosmology of quantum mechanics the latest idea is what is this universe and he used the term quantum foam it's like foam on the surface of the ocean now that's amazing 700 years ago here is this uh, non dualist philosopher in southern india oceans of time and space away using the same imagery for this universe now i'm not saying that he knew quantum mechanics he didn't but you see the intuitive understanding of this universe he says it's like foam on the surface of the ocean This ocean metaphor is very good. Uh, there's a beautiful example which is used in Vedanta, which uses the example of the ocean and the waves and water. It goes like this: Far out in the ocean, there, a wave is born. A little wave comes up, and it sees around itself other little waves, and it makes friends with some of them. Some of them are its friends. Some of them are mean to it, and it has a nice time, and it's growing up, and it sees the other waves around it. and uh, then problems come because this huge wave a tsunami wave hopefully there's no tsunami wave out there but so there's this huge wave and this wave thinks that i'll never be as big as that and it sees a little wave or maybe a bubble and says loser i'm i'm so much i'm so much bigger than that and this is a wave samsara it it creates a wave life around itself and then merrily goes around along uh, sweeping towards the to the shore and he sees in the distance this waves breaking and splitting and disappearing into spray and it asks its friend best friend wave hey what's happening there what's that oh that that's the bahamas bahamas what's that and this land but what's happening to all those waves oh well, they are dying they're dying am i going to die yes that's what happens your wave you go and crash against the shore and you die Oh my god I'm going to die I don't want to die In the meanwhile a vedantic wave sort of comes along by its side and it says <laughs> You know you know that 
by the way, there is something called water which doesn't die. The wave is worried, you know, anx anxious, I'm going to die. Yeah, good for water, but it doesn't do me any good. I'm a wave. <laughs> and this Vedantic wave says to it, why don't you look within yourself? This water, you know, it's all around us. It's inside you, it's outside you, it's in front of you, it's behind you, it's below you, it's all around us. And when it hits the shore, it just changes form from a wave into a spray, into, into maybe water vapor, and then it goes into the sky, and then it rains back, falls back into the ocean, it becomes a wave form again, and so on and so forth. It doesn't die. Then the wave investigates, really, where is this water? Take a look within you. First take a look deep within you, say, I am not a wave, I am water, and you discover, Oh yes, deep within me there's water, but wait a minute, not only deep within me, quite on the surface too, it's water. It's, it's water outside, it's water inside. In fact, all of me is water. And his wave guru tells him, correct. <laughs> but that's just the first step. Take a look around all of us. We are all water. As water, there is no limit between you and me. Suddenly the wave gets it. I am all of this. I'm not limited to one wave. I am this wave and that wave and that bubble and the big wave and the little wave. I am all of it. In fact, I am mightier than the great ocean itself because the wave depends on water for its ex existence. The ocean depends on the water for its existence. I am the very existence of the universe, of the ocean. I am the existence of all waves. If one wave dashes into the shore and bursts into spray, it's still water, it's still me. If it is evaporated and goes to, you know, goes to heaven, it's still me. When it rains back down into the ocean, it's still me. I am one with everybody. No more jealousy, no more hatred or contempt, no more death. And an immortal existence. You'd say, good for the wave. But what about us? This is exactly what it is telling us. We are an infinite ocean of existence, consciousness, place. As this consciousness, as this existence, there is no death for us. And there is no limitation for us. We are not limited to one body. We are the existence, consciousness, place in all bodies. Not only human bodies, in plants and in animals and everything. We are the water out of which the ocean of the universe is made. There's no fear of death for us. Yes, the body will change and age and die. Doesn't matter. That's what bodies do. That's what waves do. They dash against the Bahamas and they burst into spray. I am still that existence, infinite existence, consciousness place. This, this is what they're telling us now by the ocean metaphor. In the Ashtavakra Gita, you find a very beautiful, um, very beautiful uh, use of this ocean metaphor. It says, Mai ananta maham bodhau vishwapota itastata brahmati swanta vatena namamastya sahishnuta I am an infinite ocean of existence. In me, in this infinite ocean of existence, the entire universe is like a little boat Imagine, we think we are a point of consciousness in this vast universe. Here, Ashtavakra is saying, I am the entire, the infinite ocean of existence in which the, the boat of my life, of this person, is like, it's like a little boat which floats. It floats sometimes this way and sometimes that way, guided by the winds of karma. And what is the attitude of the ocean towards the boat? You know, the big boats are there and little boats are there. The vast ocean I am not impatient. My life goes on in this way. I am not impatient with it. I am much larger than this one little life. This is just the preliminary opening theme, the ocean theme, next deeper. It can get deeper. Mayananda maham bodhau vishwa vichi swabhavata udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati in me, the infinite ocean, in ocean of existence, 
the universe comes up like a wave. The entire universe is like a wave in me, the ocean of, ocean of existence. Let the wave come up. The ocean is not increased thereby. Let the wave subside. The ocean is not decreased thereby. Let birth come, I gain nothing by it. Let death come, I lose nothing by it. Honor and dishonor, loss and gain, um, whatever, in, in health and in sickness, I am that one ocean of existence. It gets even deeper. The third level of this, uh, this ocean metaphor. Mayananta maham baudau Vishwam nama vikalpana Ati shanto nirakara Eta deva hamastita I am an infinite ocean of existence, consciousness, bliss. And what is this world? Not like a boat. Not like a wave. It is imagined in me. An ocean without any waves. Imagine a calm ocean without waves. The world is just imagination in me. And this is how I exist from eternity to eternity. Forever calm, forever formless. Ati shanta, forever calm. Nirakara, forever formless. This is what they are trying to say. We are that already, right now. All we need to do is notice it. All our spiritual practice, our religion, our worship, our practice of um, the path of knowledge, of meditation, all are meant to just give us just one little flash of this and the work is done. Life will go on. The body will take its course. Karma, Vivekananda said, let karma float it down. Care no more how body lives or goes. Its task is done. Its task is meant to bring us to this enlightenment. The wave form is meant to bring us to the enlightenment that, that we are this water, the water of existence. Almost done. I think we can do one more verse, 15, and finish. Maya has two powers. One is it projects this universe and the other one is it hides the reality from us. So the second power, the hiding power, the veiling power that's talked about in the 15th verse. Antar drig drishya yor bhedam Antar drig drishya yor bhedam Bahishya brahma sargayo Bahishya brahma sargayo Avrinotya para shakti, Avrinotya para shakti, Sasam sarasya karanam, Sasam sarasya karanam. Very significant verse. What does it say? The hiding power of Maya hides where? It hides in two places. It hides your own reality from you. When you look inside, that you are the witness consciousness, this is hidden. The seer and the seen is obscured. Antar drigdrishya yor bhedam. Antar means inside. When you look inside yourself, the distinction between seer and seen is obscured. What is the seen? The body is taken to be the seer, the consciousness. We mix them up. Technically, it is called superimposition, adhyasa. So internally, when we look inside, we find that I am a mind, I am a body, I am this person. That's the hiding power of Maya. It obscures your reality from you. The seer and the seen are mixed up. The difference is not seen clearly. And when you look out, when you look outside, what do you see? It says it hides the difference between Brahman and the universe. Here is Brahman shining in front of us in all these names and forms. All that we see are people and a hall and the trees and, and, and the sky and the ocean. What Brahman? What infinite ocean of existence? We don't seem to see it. It's like a person looking at the ocean and says, what water? I see waves and I see the surf and I see the spray and so on. Where is water? It's right there. It's only water. And here also, it's only Brahman. God only exists and shines forth in all these. You know, Vivekananda gave a lecture here in, in USA. He called it the open secret. So this is literally the open secret. It's God staring at us in our face and we don't see it. Why don't we see it? The difference between names and forms, the universe 
and the underlying Brahman is obscured by the veiling power of Maya. Brahma Sarga. Sarga means the universe and Brahman is the reality. So the reality and the universe, they are mixed up. The difference is not clear because of the veiling power of Maya. Abrinoti Aparashakti. The other power of Maya hides it. And here is the thing. Sa Samsarasya Karanam. This power of Maya, which hides Brahman from us, outside and inside, this is the cause of samsara. This is the cause of suffering. This is the cause of uh, us being involved in this life after life of struggle and strife. The projecting power of Brahman is of Maya has, does no harm. You know, even enlightened persons, after they get enlightenment, realize I am Brahman. They realize that, and they see everything is Brahman. After that also they continue seeing the world. They continue seeing their own body. They continue seeing their mind. The projecting power of Maya continues to function. That does no harm. As long as you see the reality underneath. The reality underneath is hidden by the hiding power of Maya. So it says, the cause of our samsara is this veiling power of Maya. It's not the projecting power of Maya. After enlightenment, what happens? This veiling power of Maya goes away. This is what we break through in enlightenment. And we realize Brahman within, with eyes closed, and Brahman outside, with eyes open. So the veiling power of Maya has to go. The projecting power of Maya can continue. No problem, it's fun. <laughs> the universe continues as fun for you when you realize you are Brahman. So with that grand theme, let me close for tonight. We'll pick it up tomorrow in the morning again. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat.